Today's session is called Cyber Kill Chain, an anatomy of a cyber attack. It is planned to last for 45 minutes with a question and answer session at the end. The session is being recorded and is available for viewing after the session. This usually takes a few days after editing and uploading to YouTube. At the end of the session, there will also be a short questionnaire for your feedback. This is useful for us to see. Use firstly, to see if you like the format of today's session or if you have any recommendations. Secondly, if you have any topics you would like to see covered or have projects you would like to share with us. Now, without any further delay, I'm pleased to announce we're joined by Mr. Rakesh Burgel. Rakesh has worked in the nuclear sector in the UK for 33 years and currently is based at INS, where he served as a Chief Information Security Officer for five years. Thank you, Rakesh. Over to you. Thank you, Carl. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I should also say good afternoon and good evening uh, to all attendees and colleagues around the, the globe that have joined us here in the United Kingdom. Um, um, a special welcome also to any alumni of the NCSP Fundamentals course. Um, it's great to see you, uh, if anything, virtually again. Uh, my name is Rakesh Burgle. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to present to you today as part of the NCSP program. Uh, and I hope this day finds you and your loved ones in good health and good spirits in, in these, let's face it, very strange times. Um, I do hope you can all hear and see me. Um, I'm not going to waste any time, so I'm going to get right into this. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to do is a little bit of a poll. And it's partly to test the system, but actually it's more about getting to know you, the audience out there, and for actually for the audience yourself to know each other. So if we could have the first poll, please. So which job below would best describe your role within your company? I'll just give you 45 seconds or so. So that's um, 18, 19 of 20 people voted. Get one more to vote. Oh, 19 of 19. Okay, so we'll we'll stop it there. Um, so I think most of you here are not part of the uh, security, uh, cybersecurity or IT professions. We have four security professionals, no cybersecurity professionals, and one IT professional. Um, so at least we get to know a little bit about each other and and where we're all coming from. So. Uh, just so that you don't get frightened or scared, this is not going to be a technical presentation. Um, so any technical terms that I use, I will try and define in very, very simple terms. Okay, so let's have a look at the um, agenda for the session. So um, I'm just gonna recap very quickly uh, in my first uh, couple of slides on what was covered in the fundamentals course, but then when we go beyond that, we're going to um, uh, build upon those uh, in, initial concepts. Um, and what I'd like to do is actually try and introduce you to a different way of thinking about cyber attacks. Um, and what hopefully this will allow you to do is be able to interact more confidently um, at all levels of your organizations around cybersecurity. And that's where the cyber kill chain comes in. Um, what I'll do is break down that cyber kill chain at each stage. Um, tell you what that stage is about and give you care, perhaps case studies and examples of what we can do to mitigate against each of those stages. And I guess the important thing to know about the cyber kill chain is that you only have to break that chain in one place and the cyber attack is, is finished. It basically cannot be completed, cannot be successful. And I'll talk more about that once we get, once we get into it. Uh, so to recap on what we've um, already done in the fundamentals course, uh, there is this document, which is the IAEA NSS number 17, nuclear security uh, series number 17, which deals with computer security at nuclear facilities. Um, it is based on national uh, experience and it provides guidance uh, for, for yourselves, for competent authorities and, and other people uh, interested in the subject. 
Uh, there is a specific annex uh, which deals uh, with um, operational technology uh, uh, computing, uh, and also there's also a specific annex that deals with um, behavior and security culture, which, as you'll find through this particular webinar, is going to be very, very important. <clears throat> so, again, let's let's go straight into the cyber kill chain. This is the cyber kill chain, and I'm going to put it all up at once here, and I'll talk you through it. And don't don't get frightened because my next slide, I'm I'm going to do a bit further explanation into this. But any cyber attacker, so this is all from the cyber attacker's perspective. These are the things that they have to do in order to make their attack success, successful. The first thing is reconnaissance. So you're going to attack anything. You need to find out about it. So that's reconnaissance. The second is weaponization. You need to um, deliver a uh, weapon or, or formulate a weapon that you're going to use against your target. Then you need to find out some way of delivering that weapon to the target. Uh, and then once that target, uh, once that weapon has been de delivered, then that's the point at which the exploitation of the network occurs. So, so the actual hack hasn't occurred until midway through the actual chain. At that point, um, the malware or whatever it is will install itself in, in the computing system. Uh, there might be an element of command and control, and I'll explain what that is when we get to it. And the final stage is action on objectives. And that's the part at which the objective for the attacker is actually achieved. And that could be stealing things, but it could be other things too. So that very quickly is the cyber kill chain. You'll recognize the kill chain if I put it up in this form. So let's say you wanted to steal something from a house. Uh, what you'd do is some reconnaissance on that house. You'd look through the windows, you'd find out if there's anybody in, perhaps you'd even do some social media um, uh, uh, research to find out if anybody's in that house. You'll then decide what weapon you want to use to get inside that house. And in this example, I've used a crowbar. You'll then deliver that weapon to the point at which you want to uh, create the entry. And once you've created that entry, you're going to exploit that vulnerability that you've, that you've just created. And at that point, you're into the actual system itself. You're into the house itself. And you want to install yourself in that house. You might shut the curtains, switch the lights off, just make it look like there's nobody actually there and there's no activity. You might even have an element of command and control. In other words, you might have people on the outside who are keeping uh, a watch for anybody returning or giving you instructions on where to go in the house uh, in order to get what, what it is that you actually need. And your final objective is to get away from, from the house itself without being caught, obviously. Um, so the cyber kill chain is literally the same as any sort of kill chain in any attack chain and actually does derive from, from military use. So let's look at the different parts of the cyber kill chain. And I'm going to start there. What I put here at the top um, is the cyber kill chain itself. So where it's marked red, we're at that, that part of the kill chain. And I've given you some examples here at the bottom of the types of reconnaissance that, that cyber attackers would use, um, the types of techniques that they would use in order to do reconnaissance. There's something called Nmap, uh, and we're going to look, look at these in a little more detail. Something called Shodan, which is a website, and I'll take you to that website and show you it. Uh, there are something um, IT message boards and something called social engineering, which if you've been to my sessions before, you'll know all about social engineering, but we'll touch on that too. So starting with um, Nmap, it's a piece of software that hackers use in, in order to carry out uh, network reconnaissance. It's uh, short for network mapper. It's free, uh, and actually it's free is a, um, is a flag for all of the software pretty much that I'm going to mention. Most of the software that I'm going to talk about is free and easily downloadable from the internet. Uh, it's used for network discovery. So basically, if you can implant it on a system, then you can use it to discover what's on that system. Or if you're outside the system, you can use it to discover um, what devices are on the system, what operating system it runs, and what services and ports it has. So don't worry about services and ports. Services and ports are a bit like, ports are a bit like doors and doors on a computer uh, and they perform different functions or services. 
um, but don't worry too much about that. And, and one of the key things about Nmap is that it can be used uh, for good uh, and it can be used for, for bad things. Um, I wasn't going to show you Nmap, it's quite a technical thing, um, but what I do want to show you is on the next slide, uh, a demonstration of Shodan. Shodan is a website, I'm going to go to it shortly and show you what it is. Uh, it is also free, there are elements of it that you can pay for, but it's basically a Google and search engine for internet connected devices. So if you want to search for internet connected devices, you would use Shodan. Uh, of course, it can be used for good things, it can be used for bad things. Uh, so let's now take a look at Shodan. So I am going to just switch my view here uh, to a different view. And hopefully you can see the Shodan website that I've got in front of you here. And there's a little bit about what it is. Shodan is the world's first search engine for internet connected devices. You can do a lot of exploring. I've actually logged into my account here. And what I'd like to show you is if I click on explore, you can on the left hand side see the types of categories of connected devices that you can look at. So you can look at industrial control systems, databases, video games. And then on the right hand side, there are other categories of things that you can look for. Uh, now, there is a search pane up here. So if you wanted to search for specific things, you could. But let me take you as an example to, let's say, default passwords. If I click on default passwords, what I end up with is a list of devices and their IP addresses. Their IP address is basically the same as the physical address of your house. You can geolocate it. So this IP address here is the IP address of this particular machine, which happens to be a router. And it, this uh, website tells me it's located in Germany, in Dusseldorf. And um, there's also some information related to it. Uh, let's go to another example here. Here's another example in the United States. Uh, that's the IP address of the, uh, of the device itself. And in this particular case, it very helpfully tells you what the username and password is for that device. So if I knew what type of device that was, I could try to connect to it. I could use this default username and password and I could connect to it. So that in, in, in very simple terms is what Shodan is. And it isn't restricted to just, um, you know, uh, default passwords, uh, webcams, net cams. So any webcams out there that are insecure um, will appear on on Shodan and you can access those webcams. And if you uh, had any dark intent, uh, you could try and hack those webcams and try and connect to those webcams. So it's a pretty scary place. It can be used for good things. It can be used for bad things. And there have been some pretty scary cases of webcams being hacked. And in one particular case in America, um, a couple received an email from a white hat hacker. A white hat hacker is supposed to be the good guy uh, who contacted them and said that their webcam had been hacked, not by them, by somebody else. And would they like to change their default password? And that actually is the um, control against this particular um, vulnerability. When you get a new device and you connect it to the internet, make sure that you change the default password of that device. Okay, so let's move on. I'm going to swap back to um, just hold on one second. Um, just having a little bit of trouble here. Oh, um, I'm just trying to play my. Um, there it is. Okay. Hopefully, uh, you can now uh, we'll see the slides again. So we're back into the slides. Um, so that was the demonstration of Shodan. Um, it, it, it is a bit scary. The next thing I wanted to talk about, so we're still in, this, in the reconnaissance phase. Um, so bad guys, what they do is they go onto message board forums and they um, 
try to target IT professionals from their target organization. So the, if they're targeting my organization, uh, as an example, they would try and identify who the IT professionals were, and they would try and find out from social media where these IT professionals start um, talking about their work. And um, so reconnaissance on IT forums is, is actually a very useful thing to do for, for the bad guys, certainly. Uh, information in the public domain uh, is, is another example. Um, so social engineering we've talked about, this is where you trick people into doing something or revealing something that they, that they shouldn't. And there are examples of this quite a lot. Um, if you go on, on YouTube and type in uh, social engineering, you'll get a lot of hits on, on how this actually works. Um, I didn't want to spend too much time on this, but it's basically tricking people into revealing information. Um, the second one there is Google hacking. Um, Google hacking is um, using Google in, in a slightly different way. Um, and, and, and let me show you what I mean. So if I go to, if I go back to my web browser and if I type in google.co.uk, um, if I type in a command here, which is, uh, this is simply in the search pane for Google. So what I've typed in is insight in youserve.com. Inuserve.com happens to be the website or the web uh, site of, of INS, my, my organization. And then I've typed something else here, file type, type PDF. If I press enter, what I get is a search return from within our own website. And all it returns to me are all the PDFs that we've ever published on our website. So that's every PDF on the INS websites. I could change that to doc file and search for every doc file that we've ever shared. And it comes up with no matches. And that's good because our policy is that we do not publish document files, doc files that are editable. We only publish PDF files. Uh, in the same way I could do an Excel spreadsheet search and we don't publish any Excel spreadsheets either because those are editable. So that's a good policy to have, to only publish documents as PDF and to make sure that you don't publish anything that is sensitive. So um, I'm gonna move back now to the presentation. Just excuse me for one second. That was Google hacking. Dumpster diving is, um, it's basically, ratching around in people's bins. Um, so if you know um, where a company is situated that you want to target, you would simply go around to the back of the, uh, the building and you would um, rat around in their bins to try and find information that might be of use to you. So that is um, dumpster diving. Uh, the mitigations against this particular phase of the attack is secure behavior, trust but verify. So in other words, your people, um, if they noti notice um, if they notice um, strange behavior or odd behavior uh, or uh, in other people or in their IT system, then reporting that is, is a very important thing. Um, I've just talked about secure publication and social media policies. So make sure that you publish documents that you only need to publish and you don't publish anything that's, that's um, of a sensitive nature. And make sure you have a social media policy. In other words, that you tell people that work for you that they shouldn't, or what they can and can't be saying on social media about the company, because that is a rich source of information for the attacker. Secure disposal, so shred all your information within your office space if you can. Um, disable ports and services you don't need. So this, this is a technical computer thing, um, and it is disabling um, services or functionality that your computer has that you don't, if you don't need it, then disable it so nobody else can make use of it. Um, and configuring firewalls and intrusion prevention systems correctly. Again, this is a very technical one. Um, we don't need to spend too much time on it because it's probably too technical. Um, the very final one is a very important one. So that's a strong reporting culture. Um, if your people are not reporting odd things to you or odd behaviors or odd behaviors of, of computers and systems, 
then you're missing out on a, on a rich vein of intelligence there. So have a, have a good reporting culture, basically. So um, moving on, um, we're going to move on to poll question two, I think. So how much influence do you have with senior executive in order to affect change in security? I'll just give you 30 seconds on that. So that's 23 of 36 of you. Five percent. Okay, we'll um, we might as well end it there. So um, it seems like there's quite a few of you. Twenty percent of you who, twenty-one percent of you who don't have any influence. Um, actually, fifty percent of you that have very little to no influence, um, and uh, the rest having some influence. Uh, there's four of you that have quite a bit of influence, which is that's a good thing. And perhaps later we can talk around. Um, influencing your senior executive. Um, okay, so so thank you, thank you for that. Um, so I'm moving on now to uh, weaponization. Um, so this is where the cyber adversary uh, makes a, a weapon uh, based on what vulnerability they've discovered in their reconnaissance. And there's a, a, a many things that they can do. They can infect files, for example, Microsoft Word files. They can infect you know, USB sticks. They can infect websites, something called a watering hole attack. And I will touch on the watering hole attack in a second in my latest slide. They can even infect updates. So when you're updating your software, um, there have been cases of people um, taking control of the update process. Uh, and that's a, a very, very serious thing. Not, not many examples, but some examples of that. So, so in this stage of uh, weaponization, um, they basically can either use a pre-existing cyber weapons of which there are many, many freely available ones uh, out there on the internet. Um, they could uh, design their own cyber weapons, but they'd have to be pretty, um, pretty skilled and specialized at doing that. Uh, they could potentially buy um, that design. Uh, and I've heard of cases of people buying uh, hacking services um, for vulnerabilities costing anywhere between 100 to 500,000 US dollars. So I guess the point there is, even if you don't have the capability yourself, if you've got money, then you can buy that capability in. Um, you could design phishing emails, you could infect USBs in readiness, or you could create an infected website or infect an existing one. And at this stage, you've got absolutely no interaction with the victim yet. You're still creating your weapon. Um, so there are very, because of that, because there's very little in interaction with the victim at the time, there are very few mitigations against this sort of attack. Um, I think the best you can do is reduce the number of vulnerabilities on your network, so carry out a, a lot of patching. Um, you could disable macros in Microsoft Office so that when people receive um, Word documents or Excel files, they can't use the macros in them, and therefore they can't be infected either. And you could disable JavaScript and other browser plugins. So these are these plugins, JavaScript, um, make w uh, web surfing a richer experience, but it, and if you switch them off, then you can't have that rich web browsing experience, uh, but you are safer. So there's a balance there to be had between safety and security. Um, so at this stage, we're now at uh, delivery. So we've decided what weapon we're going to use. We're going to deliver that weapon. And there's a few things we can use here. We can use phishing emails. We can uh, deliver infected USBs. And I've heard plenty of cases of infected USBs being given out at conferences. Um, we test our employees by throwing um, USB sticks in our car park, and we see how many actually are picked up and plugged into the system. Um, or you could um, you know, spread them out liberally at coffee shops that you know your tar target organization goes to frequently. Uh, and also deliver through an infected 
uh, website, the watering hole attack. Uh, we've seen phishing emails before. They look convincing. Uh, this one's a PayPal one. It's not genuine. There are a few giveaways uh, as well. Um, my advice is do not click on links in emails that you get. Uh, educate your staff to do exactly the same or not to click on links. Test your staff. So we carry out testing. So we send out deliberately um, uh, deliberate emails that are phishing emails and we keep the statistics of who clicks on them and we're not we, we are interested in who clicks on them because we need to do further training so but we're not interested from the perspective of punishing them we, we never punish people we retrain people so um, we keep that kind of phishing statistic we make it fun as well so the quicker that somebody opens a phishing email and reports it as a phishing email we give them points for it and it's become a bit of a competition within our organization. Um, so the dangers of USB, if you've been to one of my sessions, you've probably seen a slide like this before. Uh, which of these mosquitoes is carrying uh, malaria? Uh, the answer is we don't know. Uh, and therefore, which of these USBs is carrying malware? The answer is by looking at them, we simply don't know. So if you don't trust uh, USB sticks, uh, or, or where they've come from, why would you ever use them? Um, and so please, please be wary of USB sticks. Uh, talking quickly about the watering hole attack, uh, this is another delivery mechanism. So if I was to poison the water uh, that these animals here are drinking, the poison would be taken up by the animals and the animals would be affected by the poison. Uh, that's this very simple um, sort of uh, idea of the watering hole attack. You infect something that will infect your target. So in my cyber example, here is a web server. So it's a computer that you surf to over the internet in order to access a website. What I would do as the uh, cyber actor is to implant my malware onto this server so that I know that my target organization visits that website very frequently. And when they visit the website, they're infected by my malware. And when they're infected by my malware, I can then access those computers over the internet. And that's the watering hole attack. And there have been examples of that happening as well. Um, so I'm going to move on here to mitigations against uh, cyber delivery. So uh, secure behaviors, awareness and training. So here is um, human behavior again. This seems to be a recurring theme. Trust but verify, again, a security behavior. Don't believe everything that you're told. Uh, try and verify it if you can. Phishing education and awareness uh, is, is a very, very important thing to do. Web filtering. So web filtering is where you don't allow people to go to websites that you know are bad and it's done by blacklisting. Um, so, so people try to go a website, they're prevented from doing so. Uh, disabling macros and something called safe browsing. So in our company, we use a system where when somebody in our organization surfs to the internet, it's not their machine that's surfing to the internet. We surf through somebody else's internet connection. They make sure that internet connection is clean for us and therefore when we when we surf the internet, it is safe for us to surf. And device management. So if you manage all your devices properly across your network, then this is a mitigation against cyber delivery. And um, I want to do a bit of a case study now, which is the uh, Kudankulam nuclear reactor in, in India. And this hack occurred um, in the last quarter of last year. So it's a very, very recent hack. And um, the person that was targeted in this hack was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission. There's a full report out on this, by the way. I've linked to the report in, in my last slide, um, and I'll show you that later. Um, so the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission uh, in India was uh, targeted. Um, malware was installed on that person's, on that individual's machine. And from that point, the attackers did have access to the network. Now, fortunately, they didn't have access to the um, operational technology, that is to say, the parts of the network that were controlling the nuclear reactor. They would only have access to the, um, the, the corporate network, as it were. Information was stolen, uh, and the malware that was identified was something called DTRAC. 
and that has been associated with the Lazarus hacking group, which is associated with North Korea. So these things do happen. They happen at all levels of the company. It isn't just about your staff clicking on uh, links or anything. It could be about very, very senior people clicking on links too. Um, and at this point, I, I want to ask you a question. Uh, and the question, if we could bring up poll question three, please. So specifically on the previous um, power plant, Kulin Kulin nuclear power plant hack, what do you think was the initial intrusion, intrusion method for that nuclear power plant hack? Okay, it's 20, uh, it's about 50, just over 50% of you have answered. Up to 70%, okay, um, we'll stop it there. Thank you. Um, those of you that answered phishing email were absolutely right. Um, so uh, the person that was targeted um, had a phishing email sent to them and they clicked on the link in that email which resulted in the malware being deposited on their on their computer um, if you answered any of the others it could have been equally any of those other things but but the question did ask for the in initial intrusion method so the in initial intrusion was the phishing email that went into the network um, and just building on that i'd like to ask another question so if we can bring up the next poll question please So uh, what would have been the most effective cyber security control to prevent that initial intrusion? I'm liking this. We're at 44, 50%. Okay, we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, so absolutely, it's a phishing awareness campaign. Um, so this is about making sure that your people understand that they shouldn't be clicking on links. Um, if you answered intruder prevention or detection system, they are good answers. Um, how, however, no intruder prevention or, or detection system is 100% proof. Um, it is really the human being that you need to target here uh, as opposed to the technology. Um, they, they are also answers. I would I would probably be doing a combination of these things, but my 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 big campaign would be a phishing awareness campaign. So so thank you for that. So I'm going to move on now. We're onto the exploitation phase of the um, of uh, of the attack. This is the point at which the attack actually occurs. So the malware is detonated. I've put that in inverted commas. It's not an actual explosion, obviously. Um, that's where it's executed and. It's usually built into the weapon itself, and it can initiate on preconditions. So it, it might not be an immediate um, detonation. It could be delayed. It could be uh, on a precondition. Uh, for example, wait until the network is really quiet and then uh, uh, deploy yourself. Or it could be um, it could be some other precondition like time. Wait until three o'clock tomorrow and then deploy. Um, and that's where the vulnerability uh, is exploited. These are exploitation techniques. These are all very technical. I'm not going to go into them. There's, uh, there's, uh, it, it would take too long to, to try and explain these, uh, but these are some of the things that can be, can be used. Um, but the mitigations against uh, exploitation, um, again, security hardening, so configuration of devices and servers, uh, IPS and IDS, um, we've talked about that already, uh, antivirus, patching, penetration testing. Uh, actually, let me spend a little uh, 15 seconds or so on penetration testing. I've skipped it again. There we go. Penetration testing is when you get people or pay people to try and attack your system. And that's a great way of finding out whether you've got uh, vulnerabilities or not. So we regularly do penetration, system, uh, pen penetration testing uh, on, on our network in, in INS. Uh, so we're approaching the end of um, the uh, the chain here, we're at the installation phase. Um, the idea of the installation phase is to make the malware part of the system. 
um, advanced adversaries will try and make it persistent. In other words, if you switch the system off and then rebooted it, the malware will still be there. Uh, and even more advanced adversaries will try and make it invisible. In, they'll try and hide or obfuscate that malware in, in other files or in, in other programs. <clears throat> so um, that's the installation phase. And in terms of mitigations against installation, uh, sorry, I've, I've just uh, talked through that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So mitigations against installation, training awareness to spot unusual computer activity. There's training and awareness again, which is referring to human behavior. <clears throat> In intruder prevention and detection systems, security hardening, there it is again. Antivirus and patching, there it is again. There's a good story around patching actually. Um, I was part of a uh, what we call a red team. Uh, we had a red team, blue team exercise. So red team is where you attack and uh, a, a network, a blue team uh, is the defenders of the network. Uh, I, sorry, I was on a blue team defending the network. And the first thing that we did when we were given the network was to patch all of the operating systems and all of the devices. And the people who were attacking, they were given some intelligence and they had their attack prepared. But because we patched their system, uh, patched the system, they weren't able to perform their initial attack. They thought they were going to get our network within the first, say, 10 minutes. In the end, it took them at least two, two and a half hours to, to break into the network. And that's the advantage of patching. It buys you time. Uh, and along with all these other things, it makes a very, very strong um, cyber defense capability. Uh, we're on to command and control now. So this is a... Um, a it's an unusual, I, I guess, uh, you might not expect this to happen, but it's where the attacker tries to maintain a connection to the target. And effectively, what happens is the malware phones home. It rings back to the attacker and says, look, I've installed myself. I'm here now. What do you want me to do? And at that point, the attacker will probably try and send the malware updates. Uh, will probably um, patch it uh, and probably give it um, for further instructions. It's as if um, the malware is like any other software on your network, except that it's being controlled by somebody else. Um, so at that point, the attacker can now discover what's on your network. They can move laterally into your network and they can report back to uh, the attacker over, over the command and control um, connection. They could even elevate their privileges in order to own the network. So if they find an administrator account, an IT administrator, for example, and they were able to hack into the IT administrator account, they would literally have God rights over the entire network. Uh, and that's a pretty scary prospect as well. Um, so what can we do about command and control? Um, there's something called cyber threat hunting. This is a relatively recent thing. I mean, it's been going on since the 80s, but it's recently been termed or coined cyber threat hunting. So these are basically people who are tasked with finding out whether adversaries are on the network, whether malware is on the network, and what that malware is doing. Um, good computer logging and protection of logs. So every computer keeps hold of logs. Um, like, for example, you know, who's logged in, when they've logged in, um, what time they logged in. And if you've got good logs and you're protecting those logs, then that's a great source of uh, mitigation against cyber con uh, command and control because you can at least pick up that, that somebody's doing something through, through the use of those logs. Um, IDS, uh, Intruder Detection Systems, I've already talked about. And next, something called next generation firewalls. So um, the old style firewalls simply allowed or disallowed certain types of traffic into and out of a network. The new types of firewalls um, also receive intelligence from um, commercial sources usually about bad websites and bad IP addresses on the internet. And those can be automatically uploaded to the firewall. And the firewall, if somebody's trying to um, surf from your uh, organization to a bad IP address, then the firewall will prevent it. So that's quite a good control as well. Uh, and we're approaching uh, the end here now, the objective. And the objective could be something called exfiltration. 
uh, where they try and make away with um, information that they uh, want to steal, for example, your intellectual property. Um, there could be further installation for, for persistence. Uh, in other words, uh, you could install more uh, software onto the network. Something called distributed denial of service. So I might not want to steal anything from your network, but if I install some software that sends traffic to, to some other person that I do want to target, then if I manage to get my software onto hundreds and thousands of computers across the world and they send uh, random computer traffic to my target, then my target system will fall over. And that's called a distributed denial of service attack. And um, the final thing I wanted to say about action on objectives is wh where an adversary does want to leave the network, in other words, they've stolen your intellectual property, but they want to cover their tracks, they, they will have a cleanup operation. They will clean up where the malware has been installed. They will have a look at logs and delete logs if they can. And they will make it very, very difficult for you to identify exactly what happened and when it happened and who did it. And that is um, the action on objectives. Your mitigations here is if you can understand the motivations of your adversary, if you understand what they're after, if they're after your intellectual property, for example, then you can take special actions with your intellectual property. You can put them in a uh, slightly different place or you can put more cyber protections around them. Uh, network segmentation is, it's basically drawing sort of virtual fences within your network. So even if one part of your network was compromised, um, an attacker would have to compromise more parts of your network and they would find that very, very difficult to do. Um, you could use something called honeypots, which are, is a false network, basically. You could set up a network that isn't really a network and you could put information in there that isn't real information. And so people could, uh, attackers could uh, discover your honeypot, think they're in an actual network steal what they think is your actual information, but, but it isn't, it's just false information. Um, traffic and other logs, these are good mitigations. I've already talked about that. And there we go again, there's staff awareness and training. You know, humans really are your sensors, they're, they're, they're your, your human sensors on a cybersecurity system. Uh, and it's, it's vitally important we train them uh, properly as well. Uh, finally, there's something called zero trust security. Um, so, Zero Trust Security takes network segmentation to an extreme level. So it basically says every device on the network is not to be trusted unless it authenticates uh, properly. Um, so we've gone from saying my network is secure and safe, I trust everything in it, to saying I don't trust anything in my network unless it authenticates to me. Um, and that could be a uh, attack that you take. So um, that's the cyber kill chain. Uh, there's the full chain there. Um, we've been through it. Um, I just wanted to talk about how you might use this in practice. Um, so for me, um, there, there are many different ways of doing this. This is just one way of doing it. Uh, this could be a blueprint for building you know, your cyber security program. So what you would do is build multiple layers of security at each stage of the chain. Uh, and what that will do is make it as difficult as you can for the attacker. So um, hackers are inherently very lazy people. Well, not necessarily lazy. They're, they they want the easiest route through something. If you make it as difficult as possible, they are more likely to move on to a different target um, because you, you made it difficult for them. And, and that's part of the purpose of cybersecurity. Uh, you could rate your security posture at each stage of the chain. That's a nice, simple thing to do. So you've got some metrics there as well. Uh, and you, you could start uh, metrics around mean time to detect and mean time to respond. So that is to, mean time to detect is the average time it takes you to detect that there's an adversary on your network. And the mean time to respond is the average time it would take you to respond to that detection and do something about it. And, and there's something called dwell time. Dwell time is the average length of time that an attacker is, is on a network. And there was one study done by the Ponemon Institute. And uh, if I was to ask you the question, 
um, you know, what do you think might be an average dwell time? Might it be days? Might it be weeks? Might it be months? Um, the dwell time currently is 191 days. So a cyber attacker is on your system for 191 days on average before you can detect that cyber attacker. Some people do it better, some people do it worse. And using cyber intelligence. So if you have intelligence sources and they tell you that you're going to be targeted for a particular thing, then you can use the cyber kill chain in order to start building defenses against, against that particular, particular attack. Um, I just, uh, I'm in the closing slides now. I just wanted to look at um, uh, a slide that I put in the fundamentals course. And these are two other cybersecurity frameworks that are available as well, the NIST cybersecurity framework and ISO 27001, which you may well have heard of. Um, you can use any framework that you wish in order to manage your network. It really depends on what your preference is. My personal preference is the NIST cybersecurity framework because it's a very flexible framework. You can use it for IT networks or operational technology, uh, you know, industrial control systems, that kind of thing. Um, I've given you the links to, to those. Um, my final thought is, um, you know, good security, good cybersecurity, is, it's going to cost you. You know, it's going to cost you money, it's going to cost you time, resource, training your people, it's going to cost you in terms of the experts that you need. There's no denying that it's going to cost you money. But I'll tell you what, bad security is going to cost you more. It'll cost you all of the above, plus it will cost you a loss of confidence, uh, reputational impacts, possibly even safety impacts. And the big hitter in, in amongst all of that one is the reputational impacts, because we've seen nuclear events occurring um, across the world where it has affected global nuclear security policy. And so reputational impacts are, are highly important from a cybersecurity perspective. And, and here's my final, final thought. Um, if you ignore, if you don't pay enough attention to your human beings, then you will continue to lose the cyber battle. Um, I've often heard people say that human beings are the weakest uh, chain in the cybersecurity link. I like to turn that round. Human beings are your strongest cybersecurity control, so pay them uh, the, the attention that they require. Um, here's my uh, final slide, uh, the references. So the first one there is uh, uh, Major General Malik, who put together the uh, reports on the cyber attack at uh, Kudankulam. Uh, I've provided the link there. Uh, Kim Zetta, Countdown to Zero, is the story of Stuxnet. Stuxnet is the first world's first digital weapon. Um, cybersecurity weapon, and you may know some of the story of Stuxnet, but Kim Zetter makes a, a very, very interesting read out of, out of that. And my personal favorite is a book written way back in 1989 uh, by Cliff Stoll called The Cuckoo's Egg. And Cliff Stoll was a, um, he, he was a uh, physicist basically working in America, and he was just an ordinary guy and his boss came to him one day and said, um, hey, Cliff, there's a 75 cent accounting discrepancy. And in investigating that discrepancy, Cliff gets involved in an international cyber spy ring across the globe. And he uses his cyber skills in order to track down the offender. Uh, and I think it's one of my favorite reads. Uh, and with that, that is the cybersecurity um, uh, uh, chain. So. Um, that's that's my presentation. Thank you, Carl. I'm handing over to you. Thanks, Kesh. That's a great talk. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, so yeah, thank you for going through and breaking down quite complex um, issues into into layman's talk. Um, I really learned a lot. Um, so we have lots of Q and A's. If I could just remind panelists, uh, so uh, participants, uh, please use the Q and A box in Zoom to ask any questions you have. Um, yeah, not the chat function because that, that's slightly different. Um, but Kesh, I think I'll just hand over the first couple, um, uh, do the first couple and hand over to you really. But um, first one from Ross. Sure. Um, so regarding the searching with the file type operator in Google, if yep. you use doc, um, if you use docx, so is there a difference between using doc and docx? Do they capture the same information? No, they'll capture docx and they won't capture doc. So um, 
uh, you know, if you want to capture doc, then use the doc opera operator. If you want to capture docx files, use docx. Okay, so you couldn't use uh, dot doc to find dot doc x as well. I, I I don't think so. No, I, it's very uh, specific in what it tries to find you. It looks at exactly what you've written. Okay, thank you. Um, what we have here as well. Um, so, if you're if you're budget constrained. How do those in the nuclear industry advocate for funding uh, to prioritise cybersecurity measures when some elements of management don't recognise the gravity of a threat or just assume it won't happen to them? So um, uh, this is a very complicate, complicated, uh, well, it's a simple question, but it's a complicated answer. And it's made even more complex by the fact that we're dealing with global organisations here and global organisations might, might have different cultural um, nuances, if you like. Um, I, I can tell you what, what I think are good things to do in order to get your executive on board. Um, I, I think you need to find, if you can find an executive who is interested in cybersecurity, that's a really good win. Get them on side. Um, so so that's, that's, that's my first tip. Um, if, I, I think from your own perspective, I think you need to be, have I lost you? No, no, you no, I'm still, no, still here. Oh, I seem to have lost a uh, picture. Anyway. Um, so uh, the other thing from your own personal perspective, um, professional perspective, is to be aware of business strategy. And the reason I say that is the executive don't want to hear about the minor things that are happening. Oh, the firewall's gone down. What they want to hear is what effect it's going to have on, on, on the business itself. So you need to change your language from technical, tactical language to more strategic executive language. Uh, and I think... Uh, my colleague, George Foster, who was a, a director at uh, the Dune Ray plant, he would probably accord and attest to that, to, to that sentiment. So, so you need to think about the way you approach the executive. Um, another great tool is a corporate risk management framework. So if you have a corporate risk management framework, make sure the cybersecurity function is using that. Because the, the usefulness of that is, if I point out a cybersecurity risk and that risk is escalated into the corporate risk management framework, then at some point the executive are going to have to make a decision about that risk. They're going to have to either accept it or tolerate it or treat it or, or, or do something. But the point is, you've told them what the risk is formally and they formally have to accept that risk. So that's another powerful tool uh, that, that, that you could use. Um, and, and I guess the final things might be, um, don't don't inundate with masses of information. You know, the executive and senior people, they don't like to receive masses of information. If you can be very succinct about what you're trying to say um, and just go to go to them with three important things as opposed to a, a list of important things. Um, and uh, metrics is another one. So they love the executive love and senior people love metrics. So if you can provide them with metrics, that's that's good. Uh, above all, be positive. Try and be positive. This isn't you know, the world's not going to end. We, we can beat this thing if, if we work hard to do it. No, thanks, Kesh. So find someone who's interested, hopefully get that hook, keep it simple, yep. put it in terminology and a framework which, which appeals naturally to their way of working. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Um, got a question. Um, could you possibly just very briefly, I guess, explain the Nmap scan again? Yes. So the Nmap uh, is a piece of software that you can install um, in, in, in an operating system called Linux. And what Nmap does is, if you have let, let's a home router, if you have a home router, and if you um, if you log into your home router as an administrator, your home router will tell you all the devices that are connected to to that to that router. Uh, and Nmap works pretty much like that. What it does is once you start the scan within Nmap, it goes out onto the network, it hits a device, it grabs information from that device and returns it back to you. Uh, and that's basically what a router does. And it tells you all the devices that are attached, what the operating systems are, um, and you can perform more functions than that. I, I, I hope that explains it slightly in a diff slightly different, simpler way. Uh, thanks, Kesh. Um, I think that does. I know we've only got about four minutes left now uh, before up to the hour. So I'll just take the last few, hopefully they're quick. Um, 
Cash, in your opinion, I know you say it's possible to um, defeat an anniversary at all stages of the chain. Is there one you think is most vulnerable? Um, I think we're most vulnerable uh, at the stage that we don't control. So that's the surveillance stage. Okay. Um, so we, we, if, 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 if an adversary is very, very good at what they do, we're going to find it very, very difficult to know that they're doing it. And now the only, the only caveat to that is if that adversary uses a scanning technique against your network, then they're trying to touch you at that point and they might touch you. And if they do touch you, then that's when you can get some more information on it. But I think that's the stage where we have the least amount of control. Okay, no, thanks Cash, that's understood. So mitigation, you say minimize just good curation of your, of your assets. And I guess the last question, um, I think given, given the time constraints. Um, so thank you for your questions. And as Cash said, his contact details are on the front of the slide. So please feel free to contact us if there are any outstanding questions. Um, but do you know of any instance where a cyber attack was targeted at a physical protection system itself? So um, I know we have blended attacks where you can use um, cyber, cyber means to aid a physical attack. Do we know any instance where cyber attack uh, sought to attack the PPS itself? Sorry, just repeat that last bit. I, I lost the signal then. Oh, sorry. Um, do you know of any instance where a cyber attack was targeted at a physical protection system? Um, no. So I'm, I'm not aware of, um, of any instances of that. I've got plenty of examples of non-protection um, uh, non systems. Uh, I'm afraid I can't give you any examples on that. It's an interesting question um, and, and perhaps a question that I will go away and Google immediately after this, actually. But uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so no, thank you, Gash. I think that's really interesting. Um, and as I say, thank you for your time, everyone who's dialed in. And Cash, thank you for, for your time and expertise today. Um, thank if there you. are any questions, please do um, contact us directly. Um, but in the meantime, just to say thank you for everyone for attending today's session. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and the recording will be available on YouTube in the next couple of days. So after this, we're going to send around a very short survey as well. Please do take the time to fill it in so we can help improve the sessions. Thank you to everyone who's offered um, their time and expertise for their participants, um, it, for example, in joining a panel. Um, we will, uh, I have redesigned the form, um, so please include your contact details. Many people did do that, but didn't include their contact details. So you need to get in touch again. Um, so apologies if we've not been in touch there. Um, we are looking forward to seeing you next time. Um, and just one final reminder, if you have attended the course in the UK since 2018, please look out again for the impact survey, which we send around periodically. We really do value your feedback. We're looking forward to seeing you for the next seminar and webinar. Until then, thank you for your time. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.